and it's good to be with you guys. I want to invite you to open up your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. We're in Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. We're continuing through the book of Matthew together as a church. We're in Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. I get there in just a second. You know, through the years, um, I've always had a couple of men that I disciple on a regular basis. I always have a couple of guys that I'm kind of in a one-on-one discipling relationship with. And um, one of the guys that in the past that I was with, he was a, he was a great guy. He was, um, he was really involved with the stone, had a great attitude about our discipleship relationship. He really seemed like, from everything I could tell, that he loved the Lord and <clears throat> ended up getting a job in another city and went to another city and our, our time together ended and one day out of the blue, I got a call from him. And he said, Matt, I want to let you know that I've decided that I'm, I'm no longer a Christian. I don't believe this anymore. And I was shocked. I really was. I, I had no idea how this guy that could sort of be so seemingly going hard after Jesus would all of a sudden decide one day that he didn't believe it anymore. I asked him why. And this is what he said. He said, Matt, he said, I've always liked you. I've always liked the Austin Stone, but I see all the hypocrisy in the church. He said, I see so many things in the scripture that, <clears throat> that people don't actually live out on a daily basis. And then he said something that was pretty fascinating to me. He said, I've always had doubts about God. I've always had doubts about God, but I've come to the conclusion that there are so few examples of people out there that are actually living out what the scripture says that I've come to the conclusion that none of this is true. As I look back on it, Here's what I'm pretty convinced that was going on in his life is that just like everyone, he had doubts. And these doubts about God began to sort of creep up in his heart, but instead of allowing those doubts to draw him to Jesus, like John the Baptist did last week, he allowed those doubts to sort of produce in him this deep sense of cynicism toward Christians and toward the church. And that cynicism, cynicism ultimately led him to walk away from Jesus altogether. Now, last week, what what we looked at, Pastor Halim talked about doubts and how God is not surprised by our doubts. He's not afraid of our doubts. But what he wants from us is for us to come to him with our doubts. And so what we're gonna see today is this, is that Jesus is gonna address something that's far more um, dangerous to our hearts than doubts, and that's cynicism or apathy, Okay, and, the, and it's the, ten, the tendency of our hearts to move towards cynicism and apathy towards God. Now, I want to warn you guys in advance. I want to warn you guys in advance that today is not one of those feel-good sermons. Jesus says some really difficult things in the sermon today. And so if you're here today and you're a believer and you struggle with cynicism or apathy, I want you to lean in because what we're going to see is just how critical it is that we voraciously fight against those two things in our life. So let's turn here, Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. Let me read this to you. Matthew 11, verse 12. It says, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violence take it by force. Let me read that again. He said, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. Now, for the sake of time, I'm not going to dive very deep in these verses, but their meaning is really important, so I want you to listen carefully. When you read verse 12, when Jesus says, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and violent people take it by force. At first glance, it sounds really negative. It sounds really negative. It sounds like Jesus is saying that that the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven has had all this violent stuff happen to it and happen against it. In one sense, that's true. As Jesus is saying these words, John the Baptist is literally about to get his head chopped off. But when you get into it and you study what is being said there, it's actually a very, it's a much more positive phrase. And and I'm going to tell you literally what he's saying without getting into the Greek and all that stuff. It's in the middle voice and it's boring. But anyway, here's literally what Jesus is saying. I've got it on the screen. So watch. Jesus is literally saying with that verse, he's saying that the kingdom of heaven is vigorously pressing itself forward. And it will advance by vigorous people. 
He's saying that the kingdom of heaven is vigorously pressing itself forward and it's being advanced by vigorous people. And so in other words, what he's saying, guys, is that Jesus is saying, look, the kingdom of God is on an unstoppable path. You can't stop it. And the way that the kingdom of God is going to move forward is it's going to move forward through you and me. It's going to advance through you and me, but we've got to vigorously lean into it. It's not going to be easy. The kingdom of God cannot be stopped, and it's going to be moved through you, and it's going to be moved through me, but it's not going to be easy. Is that we have to be people that are vigorously advancing the kingdom of God. That's what he's saying. Now, I want to move on, because what he's going to do next, and hear this clearly, don't miss this. He's going to address two ways that you and I can get derailed from living these kingdom advancing lives. He's going to address two things that can creep into your heart, creep into your life, and can keep you from being one of these vigorous people that's vigorously advancing the kingdom of God. He's going to talk about cynicism, and he's going to talk about apathy. And so, so Matthew chapter 11, verse 15, he continues there, and he says, he who has ears, let him hear. And look what he says next in verse 16. He says, but to what shall I compare this generation? Now look at the phrase there. He says, to what shall I compare this generation? That's a common phrase in ancient literature that basically means let me give you an analogy. So what Jesus is doing here is he's saying, I want to give you guys an analogy of why your generation is not advancing the kingdom of God vigorously through their lives. Verse 16, he says, but to what shall I compare this generation? Then he gives the analogy. He says, it is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates. And in verse 17, he says, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. And we sang a dirge and you did not mourn. <clears throat> okay, so Jesus looks at this big crowd of people and he says, the kingdom of God is moving forward. It's going to be advanced through you, but you've got to be vigorous about it. And I want to tell you why it's not happened through your life. And I want to give you an analogy. And he says, this is what your generation is like. You're like a bunch of kids that's in the marketplace. And then watch. He said, and we played the flute for you, and you didn't dance. And we sang a dirge or a funeral song for you, and you didn't mourn. <clears throat> Now, what in the world does that mean? What in the world? I had no idea. So I looked it up. And here's what's going on here. It's pretty cool, actually. (laughs) So back in the day, what would happen in Jesus' time is adults would go to the marketplace because they wanted to buy stuff, and and they didn't want their kids bugging them in the grocery store, right? Y'all get that if you got kids. And so they'd actually leave their kids out in the middle of the marketplace so they could play together. And typically, back in the day, they played two games, The first game that they played was called Wedding, right? And what they would do is the kids would would stand there in the middle of the marketplace and they would put on this sort of mock wedding. And after this fake wedding, they would pretend like they were having a reception. And this one kid would bring a flute. And at the the fake reception, he would start playing the flute. And when he started playing, everybody would start dancing to celebrate the fake wedding. And the other game that they played was called Funeral. It's a similar deal is that they would pretend like some kid had died and the kid would, I know, and he would lay down on the floor and he would pretend he was dead and they would put on the fake funeral and same kid with the flute would start playing a funeral song and then the kids would all start mourning and they would do this kind of fake mourning and wailing. Now listen, it's weird, I know. Now some of you guys have uh, teenage boys and you think to yourself all the time, this this kid's playing too many video games, right? You're thinking that. But here's the thing, at least he's not putting on fake funerals, amen? Because if I walk into my kid's room and he and his buddies are playing funeral and there's a kid playing dead on the ground and they're all like running around wailing and stuff, I'm going to like, you guys are a bunch of idiots, y'all need to go play video games right now. But that's what they're doing. Now, I want you to look carefully at how Jesus says that some of these kids responded to that game, because that's the point of the analogy. Verse 16, he says, but to what shall I compare this generation? It's like, a, it's like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to their playmates, we played a flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. 
So back in the day, what would happen? And what Jesus is saying, this generation is like, he says, whenever these kids would play wedding and funeral, there would always be a kid or two. There would always be a kid or two that, that when the flute started playing, they'd stand on the sidelines and they'd refuse to dance. They, 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 they refused to mourn. They would, they would stand on the sidelines and, and for whatever reason, they'd fold their arms and say, I don't like this game. I don't like this song. So I'm not dancing. I should have been the bride. So I'm not singing. I should have played the dead kids. So I ain't mourning. And so they would stand on the sidelines, fold their arms, and they simply would criticize what was going on. We all had friends like that. I had a friend growing up. His name was Greg. It did not matter what we were doing, what game we're playing, that dude always found some problem with it, and he'd stand on the sideline, criticize her. He'd get his stuff and go home. And Jesus looks at the crowd, and he says, that's exactly what your generation is like. That instead of following me, instead of being a person that the kingdom of God is vigorously advancing through, you're just like one of those kids that refuses to join in the dancing because you're standing on the sidelines and you're criticizing everything that happens. Jesus is specifically talking about the power of cynicism and criticality to remove you and keep you from advancing the kingdom of God. Now, what Jesus does next is he gives two specific examples, real-life examples of how this generation was being critical and cynical Look at verse 18. So he says that about your kids that aren't dancing in the morning. <clears throat> You're being critical. And here's the first example of them being critical in verse 18. He says, for John, <clears throat> that's John the Baptist, came neither eating nor drinking. And they said, he has a demon. So for John came neither eating nor drinking, and they said, he has a demon. So the first example of, their, of how this generation was being critical, he gives the example of John the Baptist. Now, guys, what do we know about John the Baptist, all right? John the Baptist was one of these guys that was all in for the kingdom of God. Y'all with me? This guy was all in for advancing the kingdom of God. And one of the ways that he completely devoted himself to the kingdom of God is that he was a minimalist. He was a minimalist. He didn't live in a, in a big, nice house. The dude lived in the desert. He didn't wear nice robes or fine clothes, he wore clothes of camel hair. He didn't eat good food. He didn't eat fine food. He ate locusts and honey, okay? And so Johnny B did those things because he didn't want anything in his life to distract him from advancing the kingdom of God, okay? Now, but in light of that, what was their response to John? How did they respond to this guy that, that did all those things for God? Did they, did they look at John and say, man, <laughs> Bro, you're godly. That's incredible that you sacrifice all those things for the kingdom of God. I want to listen to your message. Man, that's unbelievable that you give all those things up, the food, the wine, the clothes, so that you can follow God. Man, who is it that you're pointing to? Jesus, yes, I want to follow him. No, that's not what they did. They looked, listen, they looked at all the sacrifice in his life and said, man, the only reason you're doing that is because you're demon-possessed. Now, it's unbelievable. Here, here's this guy who's completely sold out for the Lord, but because of their cynical hearts, instead of listening to his message, they found a way to criticize him. Okay, now, what Jesus does next is he gives them an example of how they did the exact same thing to him. Watch, Matthew eleven eighteen. 18. He said, for John came neither eating or drinking, and they say he has a demon. Now watch what it says next in verse 19. He says, but the son of man came eating and drinking. And they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors. And so Jesus tells these guys, look, John didn't eat good food and he didn't drink wine and you criticized him. So when I came, I did eat good food. I did drink wine. I, I went to parties. I did all those things and you criticized me too. When John didn't drink wine, they said, he's crazy. He's crazy. He's, he's crazy for not drinking wine. When Jesus did drink wine, they said, you're a drunkard. You drink too much wine. When John refused to eat good food, they said, you're demon-possessed. You don't eat good food. That's because you're demon-possessed. When Jesus came, he went to parties and weddings, and he ate good food, and they said, you're a glutton. You eat too much food. And so Jesus looked at this crowd, and he says, guys, you're just like those kids. 
who pouted and sat on the sidelines and refused to get in the game because no matter how I lived, no matter how John lived, you found some excuse. You found some reason. You found some way to criticize me. And you walked away. And church, here's sort of the point to this whole part of the story. Is there's worse things that can pop up in your heart than doubt. Okay, guys, here's the deal. Everybody doubts. If you're having doubts in your heart, that is incredibly normal. Everybody doubts. And I want you to hear something today. Jesus is okay with it. John the Baptist, his cousin, the man that went all in for the kingdom, he doubted. And Jesus comforted him. Thomas, one of the disciples, doubted Jesus' resurrection. And Jesus comforted him. But... For people with this sort of critical, cynical spirit, he absolutely offered no comfort whatsoever, and he compared them to a bunch of whiny kids who completely missed out on the joy of the game because they would rather complain than focus on the beauty and the majesty and the glory of the the, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords that was standing right in front of their face. I need you to hear that. Some of you need to hear that. Your sincere doubts about God do not bother him but your critical and cynical spirit is a completely different story. Now, here's the thing. I I was thinking about it, and I was thinking that some of you here today are probably thinking, well, Matt, I, I struggle with criticality. I struggle with cynicism, but I'm not critical about Jesus. I'm critical about Jesus' people. I'm not critical or cynical about God. God's awesome, but I'm critical about the church. Now here's, here's what I want to tell you. Guys, as a, I've been a pastor for 25 years. And in my experience, Christians typically don't <clears throat> kind of walk down the road to cynicism and criticality because of Jesus. They begin to walk down the road to cynicism and criticality because of Jesus' followers, right? That's where it begins. I could tell you more Stories really than I have time today in this sermon. Just like the buddy, the, the guy I'm on the disciple, that the people that seemingly from all outward appearances were walking with Jesus, but then something happened. Some Christian wounded him. Some church leader let him down. Some church didn't meet their expectations and, and, and or some conflict arose and then, and then these little seeds of cynicism or these little seeds of criticality got planted and began to grow in their hearts. And just like those kids that Jesus talked about, they eventually remove themselves. Because of Jesus' followers, they remove themselves from friendships. They, they remove themselves from Christian community. They eventually remove themselves from church. And they stand over on the sidelines and they just criticize. But then inevitably what happens more times than not is those same people would eventually walk away from Jesus altogether. And here's why I think that happens. Because I'm convinced, guys, I'm convinced that cynicism is one of Satan's most powerful weapons that he will use against you to try to get you from advancing the kingdom of God's cynicism. Criticality will be one of the most powerful weapons he will use to get your eyes off of Jesus. And here's how he does it, because I've seen this in my own heart, in my own life. One of the things that I've noticed about me is that when I become critical of something, what I do is my, my natural sort of fleshly response when I become critical of something is to guard my heart. Y'all with me? I get hurt by somebody. Somebody wounds me, somebody hurts me, and, and, and what happens is cynicism starts creeping in, and what I do, my natural inclination is to just wall off my heart so that I never let them hurt me again. That's sort of my natural inclination. And I'm gonna tell you guys, Satan knows that's our tendency and he loves it. He loves it when we do that because he knows. He knows that if he can get you to close off and harden your heart to God's people, it's just a matter of time before you close off and harden your heart to God. And I wanna read a quote to you by C.S. Lewis and he's talking about this very thing, about how cynicism can harden our heart to the Lord. Listen carefully. He says, to love 
is to be vulnerable. If you love anything, your heart will be broken. That's true. If you want to make sure of keeping your heart intact, you must give it to no one. Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Listen to this. He says, lock it up safe in a coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, and airless, it will change. No, it will not be broken, but it will become unbreakable, impenetrable, and irredeemable. To love is to be vulnerable. Guys, his point is that cynicism causes us to withdraw our hearts. And when we withdraw our hearts, our hearts get hardened. Our hearts begin to change. And when our hearts begin to change and get hardened towards other Christians, then the inevitable result so many times I have seen is that same person begins to harden their hearts to God. And so if you're here today and you're like, Matt, honestly, if I'm honest, I struggle with cynicism, I struggle with criticality. And if you don't know whether you do or not, ask one of your friends, they'll tell you. If you struggle with that, what Jesus is saying is you can't ignore that. You can't continue to walk down that path because of its absolute power over your life to get you to turn your eyes away from Jesus. Now listen carefully. When, when Jesus dealt with John the Baptist out, he comforted him. I said that a second ago. But when he deals with cynicism and criticality, he raises the bar a little bit. And he says, that's not a good thing. Those things have the power to draw you away from God. And so they have the ability to take you away from Jesus. So you got to address him now. In the next section of verses, in the last section of verses, we'll look at what he's going to do is he's, listen, he's going to raise the bar again. And he's going to say something. He's going to say that there's something out there that's even worse for your heart than cynicism. And that's apathy. He's going to say that there's something that's worse for your soul than criticality and its indifference, okay? So let's go to Matthew 20, 11. It's the very next verse. He's compared that generation to kids that when they sang or when they played the flute, they didn't dance, sang the dirge, they didn't mourn, they're critical, they're cynical. Look what he says in verse 20. He says, then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. He says, woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and City. And Tyre and City was an evil couple of cities. They were, they were horrible. He says, for if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and City, and they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, listen, he says, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, Will you be exalted to heaven? He says, you will be brought down to Hades. There's the strong statement. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you, it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. Also, some guys, look at me. That might be the most scathing rebuke Jesus ever says in the entire Bible his entire ministry. And what is he rebuking? He's not rebuking doubt. He's not rebuking cynicism. He's rebuking apathy. He's rebuking indifference. And what he does is he rebukes these three cities, Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. And why does he rebuke them? Did you catch it? Matthew eleven twenty. 20. It says, then he began to denounce the cities. Why? Where most of his mighty works had been done but they did not repent. Listen, those were the three cities that if you go back and study, those were the three cities where Jesus did the majority of his miracles. Those are the three cities where where people, listen, they saw with their own eyes the most outward displays of Jesus' power and his divinity. And what was their response to these unbelievable displays of Jesus' power and his divinity? How did they respond to him? How did they respond to his power? 
They didn't. Nothing. They just carried on with their lives. Like nothing had happened, like they didn't see anything. They didn't, when they saw his miracles, when they saw his power, when they saw him do all these crazy things, they didn't dog him. They didn't trash him. The normal everyday people didn't try to kill him. Guys, they just ignored him. And then Jesus gives one of the strongest rebukes in the entire scripture, not because of some crazy sin, but because of their indifference. Now, I want you to watch what he says is going to happen because of their indifference. Verse 23, he says, And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You'll be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works had been done, uh, had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you, it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment than for the land of Sodom than it is for you. Here's what he just said. For those people who saw and experienced the power of God but responded with indifference, he said, you're not going to heaven. You think you're going to heaven, but you're not. And then he says something crazy. He starts talking about what it's going to be like on the day of judgment for those people who saw the power of God but responded indifference with indifference. He said, it's going to be more tolerable on that day for Sodom and Gomorrah than it will be for you. And that's crazy what he just said. Because if you know anything about Sodom and Gomorrah, those people were some good old-fashioned, hardcore sinners, man. Those people were engaging in some debaucherous stuff. And he said, it's going to be easier on the day of judgment for them, those hardcore sinners, than it's going to be for you who were good people but saw the power of God and didn't respond. This is exactly what Jesus is talking about when he says, I would rather you be hot or I'd rather you be cold. But if you're lukewarm, I'm gonna spit you out of my mouth. And why in the world does he say that? Why, why? Why does he come down so hard? Jesus Christ, why does he come down so hard on apathy and indifference? Here's the answer, look look at me. Because when we're indifferent to God, what we're saying is, God, I see your beauty. And I see your power. And I don't care. And guys, I'm going to say something really difficult today, but this is exactly what Jesus is saying. And so I want you to listen to me carefully. If you're a person that's doubting today, you're struggling with doubting God or you're a person that's seeking, you're just trying to figure all this out, or maybe you're even a person that's struggling with sin today, but you're fighting it. You're fighting against it. I want you to know that over and over and over again, Jesus was extremely patient. He was extremely loving with people that were in those situations. But if you're the kind of person that that you're just kind of coming to church a couple of times a month and you're sort of singing songs and you're listening to sermons and you're sort of bumping up and experiencing and sort of seeing the power and the presence of God but you have absolutely no intention whatsoever of ever really truly going all in for him. What Jesus just said is it would be better for you. It'd be better for you on the day of judgment for you to walk out these doors and never give God another thought than for you to go through the motions and see and experience the power of God but not respond to it. It's a hard statement. But I'll end with this. If you're here today and you're you're struggling with cynicism or criticality, again, I wanna remind you that Jesus is saying you're walking down a dangerous path, a path that has the power and the ability to harden your heart. And so if that's where you are today, here's what I want you to do. The step is pretty simple. The best way you know how, I think you need to get your eyes off of Christ's followers and get your eyes on Jesus. You you need to get your eyes off the church and get your eyes onto the head of the church. You need to get your eyes off of of the world and, and get your eyes onto the creator of the world. And remember, because when you're focusing on on people and, and all the flaws and the failures and, and, and all that stuff, yeah, you're gonna be, you're, become, you're gonna become critical. I, I do. There's a reason Jesus had to come and die for us, amen? 
because we're messed up. We're flawed, we're broken, we are hypocritical. We, we're gonna let you down. Stop expecting us not to. But here's the promise you can take to the bank. If you'll get your eyes off of people and get your eyes onto Jesus and get off of Twitter and get in the Bible, you'll discover something that there is one, his name is Jesus Christ, and he will never let you down. And when you focus on him and you get on your knees and you cry out to him and you just get your eyes and your heart on him, he won't harden your heart, he'll soften your heart. And then he'll give you the ability to go out and love those people that you never could have if your eyes were focused on them. Same application today for those of you struggling with apathy. Guys, by the way, I've been there before. And if you're in a dry season in your life, and honestly, you've, you've come to the place where, man, you're like, I don't know if I care anymore. I think the same thing. I think you, you have got to take the step of getting on your knees, whether it's in this room or you go home, you skip lunch, and you get in a closet somewhere, and you get on your knees, and you beg God to show you his beauty, show you his power, and say, God, I'm I'm struggling, I'm dry, I need you to change me. You beg God to do that because there is coming, it's called the day of judgment. And on that day, guys, you and I are gonna stand alone face to face before the God of the universe. And when you see him on that day, and you're standing, just you and him, and you see him in all his beauty, and all his power, and all his glory, and all his holiness, and all his majesty. I want to make a promise to you. In that moment, when you're standing face to face with Jesus, you will not be critical. I promise you, when you're standing before the King of kings and the Lord of lords, you're not going to be like, hey, Jesus, I don't like that music. Will you change it? When you stand before Jesus Christ and you see him in all his glory, you're not going to be like, how come you let that guy in? When you stand before Jesus, you're not going to be like, hey, Jesus, before um, I bow down and worship you, i got some questions I've always wanted to ask you. None of this made sense, and so let's have a little dialogue here. When Isaiah stood in the presence of God, you remember his response? He hit his face. Boom. Dropped on the ground. You remember what he said? He wasn't critical of anybody but himself. When he saw the presence of God, he hit the floor and he said, woe is me for I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. When you and I stand before the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the only thing we're gonna be critical of is ourselves. And here's another promise for you. When you stand face to face with the Lord, the God of the universe, I wanna make another promise to you. I promise you, you won't be apathetic in that moment. I promise you. You're not gonna stand before the Lord and see him for the first time in all his glory and say, cool, where are we gonna go eat? You're not gonna do that. You'll fall on your face and you will worship him. And so if that's where you're at, I don't know what to tell you other than you need to beg God to show you his beauty show you his power and soften your heart to respond to it because that day is coming. And so I wanna end with this. I wanna just remind you of the words of um, an old hymn that I remembered when I was writing this sermon that I think is really applicable today. It says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. So that when the music starts playing, do that. So the music starts playing, you don't miss it. Let's pray.
I want you to do this just for a second as the band comes up. Man, I, I think what we ought to do right now is I think it would be worth our time, worth your time just to think about the day of judgment. Think about what that's going to be like. <clears throat> when you're standing before him, Yeah, we're going to fall on our face, and yeah, we're going to be in awe of him, and yeah, that's the thing, but you're also going to be aware that everything you gave up, everything you walked away from, every punch you took will have been worth it when you see the beauty and the all-encompassing love of Jesus. So maybe ask him today, Father, replace my cynicism with a soft heart. Just ask him that. Father, replace my cynicism with a soft heart. Ask him to help you love like he loved. And if you're apathetic today, I want you to ask him, Father, wake me up. Get my eyes off the stuff of this world and let me experience the fullness of joy that can only be found in your presence. Our days are short. Ask him to change you. Father, I pray that you have forgiven me, that you would forgive me for the times when I have allowed those things to creep into my heart. And Father, I pray that you would make me a man with a soft heart. Father, I pray that you would make me a man that is alive to you, that cares more about you and is more in love with you than anything in this world, so that I can be a man that vigorously presses forward your kingdom no matter what people say. I pray for that, for our church, for everybody that's here today, and I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.